chapter 5. After the artful Dodger and Charlie had stolen from Mr. Brownlow's handkerchief, they dodged into a nearby doorway to hide until all the excitement was over. They saw Mr. Brownlow chase Oliver and knew that the boy would be arrested by the police. Ha ha ha, laughed Charlie as they made their way home together. To see him running away at that pace with the crowd after him, and all the time I have, all the time I have the wipe in my pocket. Oh, it's too much. Be quiet. Do you want to get grabbed by the police? What'll Fagin say about this? The Dodger asked in a voice full of fear. Charlie made no reply, but he stopped laughing. Fagin was standing over the fire when he heard the sound of their footsteps echoing on the cre creaking stairs. Where's Oliver, he demanded as soon as they walked in. What's become of the boy? Speak out or I'll thrash you. Why, the traps have got him. That's all, said the Dodger. And he twisted himself loose, snatched up the toasting fork, and darted around, trying to stab the old man with it. Fagin stepped back, picked up a pot of beer, and meant to throw it at the boy, but he hit him on else instead. Why, who threw that thing at me? growled a deep voice from the darkness of the doorway. A short, strong-looking man in a battered hat with a nasty skull on his face had arrived in the middle of the quarrel. A dirty white dog with a scratched face followed him into the room. What are you up to now, Fagin? The man sneered. Treating the boys badly, are you? It's a wonder they don't all murder you. I would if I was one of them and had to take orders from you. Hush, Mr. Sykes, said the old man fearfully. Don't speak so loudly. Don't mister me, the man growled. You know what my name is? Say it. All right, then. Bill Sykes, said Fagin meekly. Come sit down, Bill, and have a drink. When both Bill Sykes and Fagin were seated with drinks in front of them, the Dodger told the story of Oliver's capture by the police. I'm afraid he may talk to the police about us, said Fagin, and get us all into many trouble into much trouble. We've planned so many robberies together, Bill. If I was taken by the police, you'd sure be taken too. We must find out what's happened to him, said Bill Sykes in a very low voice. We must send someone over to the courthouse to ask about him. If he is not in jail, then we must find out where he is and grab him the first chance we get. Meanwhile, Cab was rolling away from the courthouse in great haste through many of the same streets that Oliver had walked with the Dodger when he first came to London. At last, the cab turned onto a quiet, shady street and stopped in front of a neat-looking brick house where Mr. Brownlow lived. The old gentleman gathered Oliver into his arms and carried him up to a comfortable bed in a large, sunny room. Oliver was watched over and cared for with loving attention by Mr. Brownlow's housekeeper, a gray-haired woman named Mrs. Bedwin. But for many days, he knew nothing of the kindness of his new friends. He lay trembling with fever without seeing or hearing anything that went around him. Finally, he woke from what seemed to have been a long and troubled sleep. Where am I, said Oliver weakly. This is not the place I went to sleep in. Hush, dear, said Mrs. Bedwin softly. You must rest quietly if you are to get well again. With those words, the old lady very gently placed Oliver's head upon the pillow and smoothed his hair in from his face. In three days' time, Oliver was well enough to sit up. Mrs. Bedwin carried him downstairs and placed him in an armchair propped up with pillows. Are you very fond of pictures, dear? Mrs. Bedwin asked. Oliver was staring, start, staring at most intently at the portrait of a lady that hung on the wall. I have seen so few that I really don't know, he said. What a beautiful, mild face that lady has. The old lady looked at him and smiled. Just then, Mr. Brownlow walked into the room. Oliver told the old gentleman that he was very happy and very grateful for all his goodness. Mr. Brownlow was about to reply when he suddenly glanced up and exclaimed, Good heavens, Oliver. You look so much like the woman in that picture that it takes my breath away. Mr. Brownlow was very eager to question Oliver about his past and how, and find out how he came to be in the company of thieves. But he wanted to wait until the boy had fully recovered from his illness first. When Mr. Oliver was well enough to get out of bed, Mr. Brownlow gave him a new suit of clothes. Everyone was so kind and gentle. It was like heaven to Oliver after his noisy, dirty life. Not long after, Oliver first saw the portrait of the lady. Mr. Brownlow asked to speak to him in his study. He asked Oliver about his past. Afterward, he began teaching Oliver in order to prepare him for school. 
Oliver had been in the room a good while when Mr. Bedwin, Mrs. Bedwin entered with a small parcel of books. They were from the same bookseller who had helped Oliver in court. Oh dear, cried Mr. Brownlow. He has left, and I wanted to pay him the money that I owe him. Please let me take it to him, sir, cried Oliver eagerly. I will return as soon as I can. Mr. Brownlow was about to say that Oliver should not go out yet, but then he smiled, gave him the money, and told him to hurry after the bookseller. Oliver didn't know he was being followed on his way to the marketplace by Bill Sykes and Nancy, another member of Fagin's gang. He was walking along, thinking of how happy he felt, when a, str when a pair of strong hands around his neck stopped him. Let go of me, Oliver cried as he struggled. Help, help. But there was no one to hear his screams. Oh, my dear brother, cried Nancy. We have been looking all over for you. By this time, a crowd had formed. Nancy explained to the crowd that Oliver was her brother and that he had run away from home. Oliver tried to tell the people that this was a lie, but Nancy seemed so worried that the people behave believed her. Nancy and Sykes led Oliver away. If you so much as say a word, I'll set the dog on you, growled Bill Sykes. Now take hold of my hand. Oliver was pulled th through many dark, narrow streets to the crooked old house where Fagin lived. Glad to see you li looking so well, my dear, Fagin said, laughing. The artful dodger went through Oliver's pockets and took the money that was meant for the bookseller. I'll take that money, said Fagin. Oh, please don't, pleaded Oliver. It is from the kind old gentleman who helped me when I was dying from fever. Please send it back to him. He and Mrs. Bedwin will think that I stole it. Ha ha, that's right, Oliver. They will think you stole it, the old man cackled. That's right, Oliver, repeated Bill Sykes. And they won't send the police after you either, for fear you should be thrown in jail. While these words were being spoken, Oliver looked from one to another in disbelief. He was afraid of them both, but he forgot his fear when, uh, when he thought of how kind Mr. Brownlow and Mrs. Bedwin would think him a liar and a thief. He jumped suddenly to his feet and ran wildly from the room, screaming for help. But he was stopped by the artful dodger. Then Fagin grabbed Oliver and was about to beat him with a club. He handed he landed one blow, but before the second blow landed, Nancy rushed forward and grabbed grabbed the club from Fagin's hands and threw it into the fire. I won't stand by you and watch you beat him, Fagin, Nancy cried. You got the boy. What more could you want? Sykes and Fagin stared at Nancy. Fagin tried to calm her down, but Nancy wouldn't listen. From this night forth, Oliver will be a thief and a liar. Is that enough for you? You must, must you beat him too? I know the ter terrible life he will live. I have been thieving for you since I was half as old as Oliver, cried Nancy. Then she rushed toward Fagin to attack, but Sykes caught her by the wrist. After a brief struggle, Nancy fainted. Mr. Brownlow and Mrs. Bedwin waited until long after dark for Oliver to return. They were fearful, but Sykes had been right. They didn't send for the police.